All right, so Joshua being the higher seed, it looks like he is going to be able to go first. And already we see a very interesting card. You see a fairy godmother being inked. I don't think I've seen that being played in an Amethyst Ruby deck before, to be honest. That is uh, way, way outside of what I'm used to, uh, to be honest with you. Looks like we're playing in, oh, I'm sorry, in, uh, an Amethyst Amber deck is what it looks like we're playing, uh, that Joshua is playing. This could be a little bit tricky for Albert, to be honest with you. Um, Ruby Amethyst usually struggles into a really aggressive Amber Amethyst final deck because they uh, just come out of the gate swinging. They usually play some really aggressive characters, and uh, Ruby Amethyst usually doesn't have a way to interact with those characters while they're readied. Um, Ruby Amethyst struggles a little bit in the beginning. You can, mainly because an Amber Amethyst player can play a pretty wide board, and a lot of times the Ruby Amethyst player are playing bounce cards on turn two, like uh, Madame M Snake and Madame M Fox, and so it makes it a little bit difficult to deal with these wide boards when you're playing so narrow as Ruby Amethyst. Absolutely. What, what an interesting deck. I'm taking a moment to kind of soak this in, looking at the cards he's playing. You know, typically uh, the Amethyst Amber decks, the ones we usually see are hyper aggressive. They're they're very, um, they try to build that Lord lead super early. Uh, but in this deck, we see um, some Muf uh, Mufasa's um, Fairy Godmother, some interesting cards. So I'm excited to see what Joshua's game plan here is and how this is going to play out. Yeah, it's really honestly so exciting to see such an unconventional deck all the way up here in top four. I mean, if you would have asked me what deck I expected to be in top four, Amber Amethyst would not be one of them. And this is the second time that we see that Fairy Godmother. Liam, why don't you tell us what this Fairy Godmother does? Yeah, Fairy Godmother is a three cost, three, four with one lore. And her ability is leave it to me. Whenever you play a character named Cinderella, you may exert chosen character. So this is a card, uh, you know, if Cinderella's are available that you can use to exert your opponent's characters, but at this point, um, it's not not able to, yeah, I don't know. I, it's We haven't seen this card yet. No, kind of, no, I'm, I'm very kind of trying to figure it out right to now. To see this, the only uh, Cinderella card that I can think of off the top of my head in either Amethyst or Amber is the single Cinderella one cost singer card. Um, but, right. But even then, she's only singer three. You're not really working in inks that play a ton of phenomenal songs in there, to be honest with you. We do see this shift, Fairy Godmother, though, and I think that one is going to be um, something to look out for because she can be a really strong card once on board. She can shift for two. Uh, she's an inkable five cost, three, four with two lore, and she has an ability that says whenever this character quests, your characters get challenger plus three, and when this character is banished in a challenge, return this card to your hand this turn. So... Essentially, when Fairy Godmother enters play, um, you're looking to shift Fairy Godmother so that you can quest that turn, giving the rest of your characters challenger plus three, meaning they'll be able to challenge for with an extra three strength. And then when they are banished in that challenge, instead of going to the discard pile, they come back to your hand, which is a really interesting take on uh, what is typically a really aggressive ink combo with Amber Amethyst, where you're playing a bunch of small characters, trying to quest as fast as you can. Uh, instead, Joshua is but taking... this is why. This is the payoff for this card. Yeah, exactly. You see the Mufasa, and this is where we see a combo forming. Liam, why don't you take it and tell us what might be happening? No, played at the perfect time. I, we we're right about to go into this. I mean, you can see what you were setting up here with the Mufasa. Mufasa is a card. It's a 3-3 the quest for two, but when it's banished in a challenge, um, you can look at the top card of your deck, and if it's a character card, you can put it into play for free, essentially replacing the Mufasa. But if that card's been given Challenger and the ability from Fairy Godmother, um, then it's banished in a challenge. It goes back to your hand, and you get the card off the top of your deck, allowing you to then play the Mufasa again, and you can do some really interesting things. Yeah, I've never really seen this recycling of Mufasa. It's a very efficient way to get characters in onto the board, which I really like. I mean, this is so unique. I'm excited to be seeing this here at such a far point in the tournament here, all the way in the top eight. Who would have expected this? We have Ruby Amethyst, arguably uh, the least exciting deck. It's the one that we've seen since set one just take over the meta of set two and still be relevant here in set three versus a deck that I haven't seen anybody play before. No, nope. We've seen a lot of red fossas. We haven't seen a lot of purple fossas. So um, excited to see how this plays out. Uh, another interesting note, you know, you have cards in, uh, in uh, Amethyst, that, like the goat, that, that gain you something when they enter and leave play. So um, 
fairy godmother's ability working with a goat or with a rabbit or anything like that also allows you to to get more value out of those cards um, if they're returned to your hand uh, being banished in a challenge you can play them again yeah one of the things that we noticed there was a single amber ruby mufasa deck that made it into the top 64 and when we were watching that game we mentioned how in those mufasa lists card draw is really an issue it's difficult if you don't open the, with the mother gothel and the rapunzel to draw three cards and refill your hand you can really struggle but when you take out ruby and you put in amethyst you gain this mid-range package of really valuable cards that create a ton of value with cards like merlin rabbit and goat like liam just said cards that you want to see bounce back and forth from your hand and onto the uh board and usually that's done through cards like madame m fox and madame m snake which we still see some of in joshua's deck but he's also potentially going to be able to use the fairy godmother to add to that as well no, that's absolutely right. Talking about the, you're right about the, the limited card draw and, and getting that mid-range card draw out of it. But the, the Fairy Godmother, there's another way that allows you to do, it allows you to do more with a few cards that you have. If you can play a card, you know, two or three times uh, leveraging Fairy Godmother then and get more value out of that card, maybe the card draw is less of a problem. I also see a Perdita in Joshua's hand that he was fl flipping around with. And Perdita is also a pretty interesting Amber card. When it is played and when it quests, you get to bring back a character that costs two or less from your discard uh, or no i think you get to i think it just gets to be played i can't quite remember it's one of those two you either get to play it or bring it back to your hand either way a really strong ability being able to bring cards back from the discard reuse them over and over again and we see joshua uh his it's paying off this deck is paying off for him he's already at eight lore with alberto at three alberto has been basically having to respond to everything that joshua has been playing because he's been playing uh, a bit of an aggressive opening just gaining lore where he can playing characters that uh, are really valuable things like pascal that keep evasive uh, merlin uh, sorry merlin rabbit that draws you cards we still have the mufasa on board we have another mufasa in hand and when the mufasa gets banished or uh, leaves play we'll be able to potentially play another card from the top of joshua's deck as well and here we see the perdita doing that bringing back Cusco from the discard into play. Cusco being a card that when banished gets you to draw a card. Uh, and that Cusco, I imagine, won't be the last time that we see him coming into play to help Joshua keep uh, his handful. No, absolutely not. It's the perfect uh, two cost or less character to pull back from your discard pile with Perdita there. Because um, again, giving you that card draw. Um, I, I, it's really interesting watching what this deck's doing so far. One note on Mufasa, one thing that a lot of these uh, Mufasa roulette decks like to do is work in a few big characters um, to give you a really big payoff, and we see a Shurnabog there uh, in Joshua's hand. We can assume that there's more than one in this deck, so that Mufasa, when it leaves play, could put something quite large into play. And Brandon, there's the Cinderella. Yeah, so it looks like Joshua is playing the Cinderellas. After we saw the shift fairy godmother, I thought maybe the other fairy godmother was only in there as a shift target for the flood born fairy godmother but it looks like that's not true it looks like joshua actually is playing cinderella and i can kind of understand it there aren't a plethora of uh three cost or lower songs in amber and amethyst that usually see play but you still have cards like prince on the other side that you could potentially sing with cinderella on turn two and it looks like that's gonna wrap up the game one uh, and joshua just sort of took that one over yeah, that's that's really interesting. I do want to talk about that Cinderella combo again, though, because I, I think you're right earlier, because these Mufasa decks don't want to run a lot of songs at all, because that Mufasa is really dependent on hitting a character on the top deck. And so um, I think... Uh, one of the reasons that Cinderella is in there, obviously, is for the Fairy Godmother, but it pairs really well with Perdita. These colors do not have a lot of removal. Um, there's not a lot of damage, or there's not a lot of cards that remove your opponent's characters from the board. So what it's relying on are cards that it can exert your opponent's characters to make them targets for your challenges. Um, and that's what... Um, Cinderella can do when paired with that fairy godmother. But when Perdita can pull Cinderella back from the discard pile over and over again, it makes it easy to reuse. So there's just a ton of cards here which are allowing you to, to, to replace themselves or get maximum value out of, out of the cards in this deck.
Yeah, I love the Perdita engine that lets you bring those cards back. And man, so I was wrong. I didn't see the Be Prepared that Albert had played. The game's not over, uh, but there were enough characters in the discard for Joshua to be able to drop this absolute bomb, Chernabog, a 9-9, I believe, with three lore. Now, Chernabog is discount. His cost is discounted for every character card in your discard pile. So it makes it really efficient for you to be able to play him. And then when you do play him, you have to shuffle all of your character cards cards back into your deck. So I'm starting to see a theme here in Joshua's deck where you're using Mufasa to get cards out onto the board, using Perdita to bring back valuable cards from your discard. Uh, you're using the characters in your discard to use the Trenobog and you're using Fairy Godmother to make the most efficient, are you to make the characters as efficient as you can on board by challenging other characters and bringing them back to your hand so that you can replay them also. Absolutely. We did see the, the fairy godmother Cinderella combo go off there, and, but uh, to, to little effect because uh, Rafiki was unexerted immediately. Yeah, and Joshua is putting Albert in a, a yeah, in a be prepared or buzz situation. It looks like Albert has the be prepared to get rid of it again. Joshua being at 15 lore and Albert at 8. Albert is just trying his best to uh, keep Joshua from winning, honestly, keep Joshua from putting too many characters on board. But here we see it again, the Perdita come out, dragging another two cost or less character, in this case Cinderella, back onto the board. Albert just got rid of all those characters, and here's Perdita bringing them right back. Bringing him right back from the discard pile. Um, over on Albert's side, unfortunately, not a lot of cards in hand. Uh, he's had to use a lot of his answers already, and, and not a lot of card draw available. So um, he's looking for things to deal with this, but uh, with 15 lore, um, every single single lore now on Joshua's side of the board matters, and so he's going to have to consistently find the cards he needs to prevent questing. Here we have a Queen's Castle come on the board. This is a uh, four-cost card with two lore. Um, it has an ability uh, for every character that you put there. You get to draw an extra card at the start of your turn, but in this instance, uh, nothing to put there, but it will give him lore at the start of each one of his turns unless Joshua wants to remove it. Yeah, I really don't like this uh, Queen's Castle from Albert, to be honest from you. Not for any reason other than it's just a really slow play because it's not getting rid of any of the characters on Joshua's board. He's already at 18 lore. He has the Perdita where he can bring back another character. In this case, he brings back Madame M. Snake to bounce the Cinderella back to hand after questing with her. And it's unless Albert has a way to banish everything on board, uh, he's not going to have this game. Mufasa would even bring another character on board, even if he were able to get rid of the Mufasa also. And it looks like Joshua has the goat in hand anyway, being at 18 lore. So that is going to be game one going to Joshua. And I'll So I'm wondering what Albert is even thinking of here. The, like I've said, like we said earlier, Joshua is playing a deck that I'm really completely unfamiliar with. We can see the engine that's going on, um, and. Joshua seems to be playing a little bit more of an ag uh, uh, aggro mid-range list with a heavy top end to something like Chernabog. So I think if I was Albert, I'd be playing a pretty aggressive opening myself. And honestly, just going with the same Ruby Amethyst game plan that you normally see, which is just be as aggressive as you can on the opening and close out with cards like Merlin Goat uh, when it might be a little bit more difficult for your characters to gain much value. No, I think that's right. You know, anytime you're playing uh, Amethyst, you know, you, you once you get to 16, 17, 18 lore, especially when you have bounce cards available, you know, you're within striking distance of winning the game. So I do think Albert uh, should be thinking about, or is probably thinking about, pushing his lore um, as much as he can early, forcing Joshua in a position where he has to respond to Albert's board state um, and can't quest on his own. And that'll allow Albert to get to a place in the game later on where a lot of his answers are available. It is important that he hits his card draw in the mid game, though, perhaps a rabbit or a castle that he can start leveraging uh, to get extra cards to, to draw into those answers, though. Yeah, I'll also be interested if we see Albert start bouncing his cards with Mim and Fox, because as you mentioned in game one, Amber and Amethyst don't have great removal tools, at least for cards that are readied. They really rely on being able to play cards that exert other cards so that they can be challenged and banished. But it, uh, if Albert is able to play his cards in a way where he's playing them, questing with them, and then picking them back up with something like Madam Mim Snake or Madam Mim Fox, and then being able to replay them so that they're ready, it may be really difficult for Joshua to respond when he's in this uh, situation where he's on the draw, so he's in a position of needing to respond to Albert first. 
Absolutely. Schoenerbach's minion is a great tournament play for Joshua. Uh, one, uh, he, he can respond to the Rafiki questing if he wants to. Or um, it's another one drop that makes complete sense in this deck. Uh, you can quest with Schoenerbach's minions, and when you do, you can banish it to draw a card, putting it into your discard pile, but available to come back uh, with a Perdita. Yeah, it can come back for a Perdita, and it's also helping discount your big Chernabog in your hand if you don't want to bring it back with Perdita. Then either option is great, right? Because if you bring it back, you can quest and banish it again to draw another card, and you can just kind of keep that loop going with Perdita. When you're finally ready to play the Chernabog, you can banish it and keep it in your discard to discount the Chernabog by one more ink cost. And already it seems like we see Albert responding to Joshua in what he is playing. Interesting. So Albert definitely going with it with a go wide, more aggressive strategy, getting a lot of characters on board early um, and trying to push that lore total a little bit. Joshua expecting that might be the game plan, removing the Rafiki, not letting it quest uh, for free in perpetuity. And then Albert responding by removing that Chernabog's minions, not letting him get the card draw, but perhaps in the next turn. As a, or as a, a downside to that, you know, that mini wasn't available to quest, but here Albert with uh, much better control of the board uh, after this turn. Yeah, and to be honest, I know we talked about how difficult it might be for Joshua to respond to Albert, but if Joshua can just put himself in a place where Albert is having to respond to him, I think Joshua is just in a better place. Because of this engine that he has where he can adapt to whatever is happening in the game, whether a bunch of characters are being sent to his discard that he can pull back with Perdita, or he can play a Chernabog because of the amount of characters in his discard, or if he is gaining some sort of advantage and he wants to keep Albert from trying to do something like play Be Prepared by playing Mufasa so that when Mufasa gets banished, Joshua can play another card off the top of his deck. Joshua, I mean, this whole deck feels like it's just going to be constant pressure all the time, and it's going to take Albert. He's going to have to be really careful about when he puts the pressure on, when he's questing, when he's gaining, or pushing his win condition, and then how he's responding to Joshua so that he's not feeding the uh, game plan that Joshua is working on at that moment. Absolutely. I will say here, it is, it is important that the rabbit came out uh, turn four, highlighting that mid-game card draw. That rabbit uh, gains a card, or gives you a card when you, it enters play, and then when it leaves play, you also get to draw a card, uh, netting you two cards. Um, you know, Albert put a lot on the board early, uh, went pretty wide, um, reducing his hand size, and those are the cards that he also needs to ink. So uh, getting a few extra cards here is important and will allow him to keep going. Absolutely, and we see Joshua cleaning up the board state just a little bit, uh, using the Crab to banish the Maleficent, and using the Cusco to banish the Mini, uh, and Cusco being banished, being able to draw a card, and then Joshua doing the exact same thing that Albert is doing, playing a Rabbit on turn four to draw a card. We do see a Maui come out from Albert. Now he has Rush and Reckless. It's an inkable five cost six five, uh, so it can banish quite a few things, and because it has Reckless, it has to challenge if able, and because it has Rush, it's able to challenge the turn that it's played. So we see it go straight into this Merlin Crab, which I think is worth doing because Merlin Crab has an ability that gives a character challenge three on play and when it uh, leaves play. So if you can, you want to remove Crab on your turn if you're playing against it so that your opponent can't use that challenger plus three against you. And we see a great response by Joshua here, just playing a Mufasa, saying... I know you don't want this on board, but if you remove it, uh, I'll be able to hopefully find a character from the top of my deck and just replay something else. Yeah, it's important to note we're now into uh, turn six. Um, Albert now um, has uh, several removal options opened up to him that can deal with that Mufasa from Madame Medusa, Lady uh, Tremaine um, at six ink. And so um, Joshua, knowing that, uh, plays it, um, perhaps hoping to get something good off the top deck. You know, these decks are often referred to as Mufasa roulette decks because uh, you never know what you're going to get off the top deck. Um, and I'm always excited to see what's pulled when that card is banished. Yeah, I'm really... Uh... I'm having so much fun watching this match, watching Joshua pilot this deck because it's so new. And it just goes to show to anybody listening that you don't have to follow what everybody else is telling you. You know, I don't think I've heard a single person mention Amber Amethyst in regards to bringing it to this 2,000 player tournament. Joshua seems to have cooked up this uh, deck that has a really great engine running and is having serious success with it. We can see just how difficult of a position it puts your opponents in with the way he's playing Perdita and Mufasa. Um, and I just think it's awesome to see such a unique deck all the way up here in the top four. Uh, there goes that rabbit banishing Mufasa, giving Albert a card, but also giving a Floodborne Fairy Godmother Joshua off the top deck. 
We see another Maui coming down, getting rid of that Fairy Godmother, saying, I don't want you to get the value off of the Fairy Godmother. I don't want you to give your characters Challenger and then give them the ability to bounce back into your hand when they're banished in a challenge. Mm -hmm. Joshua also, I'll note, every time something goes into a discard pile, he does a quick count, takes a look at what's in there, uh, counts the number of characters available there uh, for a very important reason. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if there's a Chernabog sitting in his hand right now, and that is why he is counting up. And look, right there, we have a very beautiful enchanted Chernabog in his hand. He's counting to see how much ink he has and how many characters he has in play, wondering if it's worth to play down the Chernabog right now because, I mean, Chernabog is a very difficult card to get rid of. We talk about how great Ruby is at banishing other characters, but if we're honest, a lot of that is kind of conditional. A card like Madame Medusa that has seen a ton of play in the set three meta and I would say a meta-defining card uh, is usually really strong, but she only banishes cards with three strength or less. And Chernabog is a whopping 9-9 nine, nine, uh, character. So outside of something like a Be Prepared, there's not usually any other great answers to such a large card in Ruby Amethyst. No, that's absolutely right. There, there's an interesting game going on here when it comes to the removal where um, we're, we're at turn seven now. So um, Albert has B, oh, and we see two B prepared in his hand. And Joshua knows that in turn seven, B prepared are an option. Albert has probably drawn aggressively to get those and probably altered his hand aggressively to find at least one, seeing how many characters were on board last game. So Joshua has to put enough on board that he draws out the B prepareds and gets them played on his terms, putting characters on the board that he doesn't mind uh, being banished. For example, Kuzco, which will give him a card, or Fasa, which will give him a card off the top deck, um, but he has to put enough pressure there to have Albert play it when he wants him to play it. Yeah, and the really interesting thing about this that Joshua's doing such a good job of doing is he's forcing Albert to play these be prepares with these wide boards. We saw the piglet that was going to quest for three lore. Mufasa was going to quest for two lore. Um, and he's playing characters like Mufasa and Cusco, like you said, that gain a benefit off of being banished. But it's just too much lore on board for Albert to ignore. And on top of that, when Albert plays such a big card like be prepared to put all these cards in his discard, we can see Joshua counting it again. It is just further discount counting that Turnabog that's sitting in his hand. And there it is, the second be prepared. You know, Joshua knew Albert probably had one. He didn't know if he had two. Now we know he did. Um, so clearing the board again there. And no immediate benefit from Mufasa there. Um, so Joshua's starting with a blank board. But here comes Perdita. And when Perdita comes into play, we always see something that comes with it. Yeah, we'll see if Joshua decides to play anything with the Perdita. Mm. Looking at his discard currently. He's going to decide to... Not. Okay, he's taking a second. I know we have a Piglet. I think we have a Cusco in there as well, also a Pascal. So he has quite a few options. He could bring the Piglet back if he wants to to try to push for some lore. Piglet gains an extra two lore when there are two other characters on board. Uh, so that would be an interesting thing to push for extra lore. You could obviously bring back a Cusco if you wanted to to guarantee a little bit more draw. But it looks like Joshua is going to bring back the Piglet and push for that lore. Oh, yes. And he okay, still I has enough for the Chernobyl. I love this play. Oh, my goodness. Now, he's saying, uh, Albert, do you have a third be prepared? Yeah, he is pushing so much lore with this board. Three lore off of the Trinobog, three lore off of the Piglet, and two lore off of the Perdita. It's going to give him eight lore in one turn unless Albert is able to respond with a be prepared. And uh, it looks like he doesn't have it. He's just playing the rabbit. Um, but I love this because, like I said, Piglet is going to quest for three when there's two other characters on board. Perdita can bring cards back from discard. Um, and rather than playing something like the Cusco with the with the Perdita. He said, you know what? I'll bring back the Piglet, the thing that's going to push my win condition, and then I'm going to shuffle all those before I shuffle all those cards back into my deck when I play my Chernabog for free. Yeah, and unfortunately, Chernabog is just so big, and there's so many characters on board that a lot of the traditional removal options for Ruby um, aren't, aren't really available. Madame Medusa requires a character that's, that's three or less strength, and then Lady Tremaine requires you to banish a character. But if you have so many on board, Piglet becomes a, an easy choice, perhaps, um, leaving Chernabog up uh, and able to quest. So um, at one point, it looked like Joshua asked uh, the number of ink that Albert had on board, and I'm wondering if he wanted to see if he had nine, if Maleficent was an option uh, to deal with that Chernabog, because um, it really is the only 
removal answer right now to deal with that Trader Bog, I think. Yeah, and a lot of Ruby Amethyst players aren't even playing Maleficent Monster Dragon in their decks because Ruby Amethyst has leaned a little bit more mid-range and tempo oriented rather than control. So Albert may not even be playing that card, but I think you're right. It's one of the few cards that could get rid of the Trader Bog. The only other one that I can think of is Lady Tremaine, but that requires basically every other card on Joshua's side of the board to be banished so that Joshua is forced to choose the Chernabog on Lady Tremaine's ability. Um, and other than that, it's be prepared. We've already seen two, maybe three be prepared at this point from Albert. Two at least. So uh, he's definitely running out of steam here. And as you can see, Albert started with six lore early in the game, but right now Joshua is looming over him with a ton of lore and only uh, three lore currently on board for Joshua. But I mean, that's a total of eight, nine lore total that he could quest with in one turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, these, these matches just are, are so tense, you know. Um, and we also should mention they're untimed at this point, um, you know, with the tournament organizers understanding that each player wants to think very carefully about each each play, making sure they're making the optimal play, and giving each, each player the maximum opportunity. To... has a lot of ink that he still can use. I don't, under, I don't know what's in his hand currently. Uh, he seems to be looking at his discard to see what his options are. Yeah, he's, he's thinking long and hard about this. I think, you know, if, if he is drawing for answers, you know, obviously be prepared is, is one that he would, he would love to see again now. Um, you know, the alternate play with a rabbit is to, is to send it into Chernabog, perhaps get a card if you really need to draw a card. Um, if he thinks he can draw this game out another turn and survive until another, uh, he gets the opportunity to draw again, um, removing that piglet uh, may be the way to do it. But... Um, gosh, just really agonizing over this decision. Yeah, and we can see the update to the lore down at the bottom. Uh, Albert only at six, and Joshua, I thought that I thought there was a mistake there. Yeah, Joshua, we just behind a little bit. Joshua had uh, pushed up to 11 lore in one turn. He was sitting at only three, and then he was able to quest for uh, quite a bit more with the Chernabog and the Piglet well, there. I think and that would have been game. It would have been nine. Yeah, it would have been nine. And so, like, I mean, Joshua almost has the game on board and i don't even know if we've seen a single goat from joshua either so he's playing amethyst and you know we've seen it plenty of times when all they have to do is get close to 20 and then a few merlin goats can finish the game friends to the other side drawing two cards look for some answers here Okay, Albert does find the Madame Medusa to get rid of the Perdita, which is pretty good because that means Perdita will not be able to get the Piglet back from the discard this next turn, threatening three lore again. That's one of the challenges playing against Joshua's deck is every time you banish a character, it feels like it's not actually gone. It feels like it can come back at <laughs> Until any moment. Until I see you again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Either through Perdita or just Chernabog, shuffling them all back into the deck to eventually be drawn. Rapunzel, Gift of Healing, coming down. A set one card, very popular, that allows you to uh, heal a character for up to three damage and draw a card for each damage counter you remove. We see a Merlin Crab coming into play just to push even more lore. Looking at seven lore this turn, or for next turn on Joshua's end, uh, which would be game. So Albert really has to find an answer, find a way to get Joshua under six lore on board. And I think that's going to be a real feat because you really need to get rid of the Chernabog or you have to get rid of a bunch of other characters. <laughs> you really do. It's, it's, it's really the Chernabog, um, even if you get rid of two of the one lores or even if you get rid of the two lore character. Um, yeah, this is tough. Albert's going to start by challenging the fairy godmother, getting one lore off of the board. Now Joshua only has six, but that still is going to get him to 20 the next turn. So Albert needs to find a way to take out one more card. We have six, oh, I was going to say a Lady Tremaine or a Medusa. There it is. So only four lore represented on the board now. This will draw this game out another turn um, at the very least. And Joshua does not currently have a goat in hand, at least not that I can see. So now that we're under the 20 lore mark, I mean, the game's not over, but Albert has a lot of climbing back to do if he wants to take this game. 
One other thing that I think Ruby Amethyst struggles with in this matchup is Ruby Amethyst has a lot of removal, has a lot of ways to deal with the board, uh, and it's very difficult for them to get rid of something like a Chernabog, but even when you do get rid of the cards, they're not gone forever, it seems like. They go to the discard, and they can be brought back, and so eventually, uh, Ruby Amethyst is going to run out of ways to remove these characters, and unless Albert can find a way to put pressure on himself and end the game before Joshua gets away with it, uh, Joshua's just going to be able oh. to continue to play these cards over and over and over until Albert runs out of options. Oh, dear. Um, Albert uh, returning a Madame Medusa to his hand uh, to play the Madame and Fox, probably as a way to get Madame Medusa back, um, running the Fox into Chernabog to put some damage on it, but playing right into Joshua's hands uh, as Joshua was sitting with a Rapunzel, uh, waiting to remove that damage to draw three more cards, um, giving him way more options uh, at the end game here. Yeah, and one thing that Joshua is doing a great job at is he uh, is only playing enough characters. He's playing enough characters that it makes it difficult for Albert to uh, 